Hello everyone, welcome back to Earth Materials. Today I'd like to talk about rocks and minerals of the core and mantle, and this will be in a set of lectures. The first one, I'm gonna be talking about the core mineralogy and the lower mantle and D double prime layer mineralogy. The later lectures will discuss these other topics. So at the end of this lecture, I hope that students will be able to say something about how we know about the mineralogy and chemistry of the core and the composition and structure of oxides and silicates in the lower mantle. So the way I approach this is to take it as a journey from the center of the Earth, although we're not going to get very far up towards the surface in this particular lecture. So let's talk about the core. As you know, the Earth has a core. It has an inner solid core and an outer liquid core. A researcher named Inga Lehmann is the person who first discovered the occurrence of the inner core. This was based on the types of shadow zones that are observed after large earthquakes. And we think that this material is made up of iron nickel alloy. Now, why do we think that? In my previous lecture, I mentioned that this is something that we see as inclusions in diamonds now, the relatively recent discovery, where we see nickel-rich metal and iron-rich metal composite inclusions inside diamonds. But it's also what we see in meteorites. There is a metal alloy called tainite, which is an iron-nickel alloy, but there are meteorites that contain tainite, which is an iron nickel alloy that we think is representative of what we might see in the Earth's core. This alloy is not stable if it cools slowly and instead separates into an iron rich nickel poor mineral that's called camisite and a nickel rich iron poor metal that we call plesite. That's what we think these crystals are in here. There's an interesting pattern, it's called a widman statin pattern which is an intergrowth of camisite and plesite. This is an example of the widman statin pattern in a meteorite. We see this in synthetic materials too. This is an example of steel that has been cooled slowly, a carbon-rich iron alloy. So some of the, the bright lines are ferrite, which is just iron, and the darker lines are what's called cementite, which is an iron carbide. And this is actually what gives steel its strength. It's not just what we see in meteorites, it's also that we can infer the density structure as a function of pressure going into the Earth. And what we find is that a core that is iron only has too high a density for the different pressures, and that it needs to be diluted with different materials. So if we take iron and add 9% nickel and about 10% silicon, then we get a density versus pressure structure that looks like what we observe on Earth, which are these, these pluses in here. So what is a core likely made of? And the answer is nickel iron alloy, mostly. So at this point, I hope you have a better understanding of how the mineralogy and chemistry of the core is determined from experiments trying to match up that density versus pressure curve and from meteorites, just seeing that there are iron nickel alloys present in meteorites. How do we know about the lower mantle? Well, the lower mantle, so now we're talking depths greater than 670 kilometers, it's thought to be composed of perovskite structured minerals. So perovskite can be bridgmanite, which is an iron magnesium silicate, and a calcium silicate perovskite structured material, and ferroperoclase. Ferroperoclase is basically magnesium oxide with a little iron oxide dissolved into it. In the D double prime layer, so this is right at the boundary between the lower mantle and the outer core, there may be post-perovskite structured minerals, and this also has the same composition as bridgmanite, but has a different structure, and I'll show you that. So if we look at the abundances, here is the relative abundances of the different materials. In the lower mantle, most of it is this bridgmanite perovskite structured mineral. There's a lot that's ferroperoclase, and there is perovskite structured calcium silicate. 
there is probably some post-perovskite structure down at the bottom, but most of the lower mantle is composed of these three minerals with the greatest abundance being the perovskite structured bridgmanite. We do see ferropericlase inclusions in blue diamonds. Blue diamonds are thought to be our deepest samplers of materials from the interior of the earth. Bridgmanite also occurs in meteorites. So this little, little tiny grain over here is, is bridgmanite. The structure of ferropericlase turns out to be the same as halite. If you remember, halite has sodium in octahedral coordination with chlorine. And bridgmanite is the same thing. It just has magnesium here instead of sodium and oxygen instead of chlorine. And this is a very dense structure. If you look at it in like a typical Vesta image, it looks pretty boring. It's just a whole bunch of magnesium oxide octahedra all stacked together as, as tightly as possible. Okay, so that gives you a sense of this sheet and then these sheets are connected in three dimensions. The perovskite structure has a divalent cation, calcium, iron, magnesium, in this sort of strange 12-fold coordination. And now here's the strange part about it. The magnesium can also be in octahedral coordination. That's not too surprising. But so is the silicon. Okay, now this is quite unusual. It's only in super high pressure materials that silicon will take on this octahedral coordination. And so the fact that it's octahedrally coordinated is telling us that it is a very high pressure mineral. Post-perovskite has this rather odd coordination. So here are the octahedra. They're basically the same as these octahedra. But this large site in perovskite turns into this rather strange six-coordinated site that's kind of tent-shaped. And so it's, it's almost like you've got these little tents. So these are the upward-facing tents. So that's an upward-facing tent. And you have these downward-facing tents. So these are downward-facing tents. And so they go back and forth. And this just turns out to be even more dense than the perovskite structure. Now, I do want to take a little digression here to talk about oxides because it is thought that the lower mantle of the Earth does contain oxides. Probably most of it is ferropericlase. But there are other elements, for example, titanium and, and aluminum and so on, and where do they go? It is possible that some of these are in simple oxides. So here is the hematite group. Hematite is Fe2O3, corundum is Al2O3, and ilmenite is FeTiO3. These, the structure is basically ring-structured octahedra that are linked in sheets. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. And one-third of the sites, two out of six, are unoccupied in most of these materials. So hematite and corundum are essentially pure Fe2O3 and pure Al2O3. In ilmenite, there's titanium and iron, and they're not mixed up together. They create separate layers of titanium octahedra and iron octahedra that are linked together. So here's an image of hematite from the top. So you're looking down the C-axis, and you can see it's essentially an octahedral sheet, just like ferropericlase was, but there's a missing octahedron in each of these. That's because these have a charge of plus 3 rather than plus 2 in ferropericlase. If you look at it from the side, what you find is that the octahedra shift pointing direction from one sheet to another sheet. So if you put an octahedron on its side, it points in a particular direction. So this one is pointing to the left, this one is pointing to the right. This is the C direction, and the fact that the octahedra alternate pointing direction means that the net direction of the C axis is vertical, and that's what gives it hexagonal symmetry. If they were all pointing in the same direction, this mineral would not belong to the hexagonal crystal system. Here's hematite. Here's the structure of hematite. Here's the structure of corundum. Basically looks the same. These are rotated 180 degrees. And here's our structure for ilmenite with iron sheets, titanium sheets, iron sheets, and titanium sheets. But otherwise, these structures are identical. 
Another important oxide group is the rutile group. In rutile, TiO2, the octahedra are just stacked atop each other. There, there are these long chains of octahedra. I'll show you that in just a second. And there are a couple of other minerals that have the same kind of structure. There's pyrolusite, which is a manganese oxide, and cassiterite, which is tin oxide. Cassiterite is an important ore of tin. So here are those structures. Here's rutile. The c-axis is running almost vertically here. So you can see the, these two octahedra stacked on top of each other. Same thing here, same thing here. And there's an intervening octahedron that links these chains together. And then if we just look at this and expand the, the C direction, then we find that there are these stacks of octahedra that are linked to similar stacks of octahedra. And it's these chains of octahedra that define the orientation of the C axis and the elongation of the crystal. So if you look at the structure for pyrolusite and you look at the structure for cassiterite, they're essentially identical. Again, these are rotated 180 degrees, but they still have these same stacked octahedra here of pyrolusite would be manganese octahedra and cassiterite would be tin octahedra. So what simple oxide would you expect to find in abundance in the lower mantle? Yes, ferropericlase is the really important one. It is true that these other oxides, or maybe there are higher pressure polymorphs of them, but it is true that these other oxides might exist, but it's really ferropericlase that's going to be the most abundant. So at this point, I hope you'd be able to identify the different types of oxides and silicates that would be common in the lower mantle. All right, thanks.